If uh, you would analyze the meaning of the word man, the greatest example I could give, one of the greatest examples I could give would be Rick. He's a man, and he's all man, every bit of it. All of us were sore at him at one time or another. Uh, Rickenbacker used that method of getting us mad enough at him that we were going to live to spite him. Rick would withhold his fire until he could practically see the whites of the fellow's eyes, and he never missed. From my point of view, he could properly be considered the dean of the air transport industry. And of industry. And who, in the past, has received America's highest award, the Congressional Medal of Honor. Captain Eddy is a man who has been near death many times, a man who fought against all odds to retain life. He is a man who has fought this country's battles and won. An ace of aces in the First World War, and later, a stubborn visionary who had enough faith in the air age to build one of the country's major air services. This is Eddie Rickenbacker, a tough, wiry fighter. Loved by some, feared by others, but respected by all. A tough man who believes in perseverance and hard work. His good friend Arthur Godfrey puts it this way. If uh, you would analyze the meaning of the word man, the greatest example I could give, one of the greatest examples I could give would be Rick. He's a man and he's all man, every bit of it. Uh, he's a man like Kurt LeMay is a man, like J. Edgar Hoover is a man. They're... they're uh, Human, they're warm, they're big hearted. Uh, Rick is full of the love of his country. He's unafraid to die for his country. Uh, he uh, He's the old school, you know. He, he has no time whatever for uh, this sloppy business of missing education and not working. You know, every time I see him, I saw him here about a month ago, and I said, doggone it, Rick, you look better now than you did five years ago. What are you doing? He says, working. <laughs> <laughs> work, work, work is what does it, see? Eddie started this work at an early age. In fact, he was only 12 years old back in 1901 when he took his first job at $3.50 a week in a glass factory in Columbus, Ohio. His father, William, had just died, leaving his mother, Elizabeth, and seven other children. Eddie was well able to take care of himself. He'd smoked cigarettes by the time he was in the first grade, and he got into so many fights that he seemed to be trying to cultivate two permanent black eyes. But when the time came, he felt his responsibility and rose to it. In the next three years, he tried his hand at a variety of jobs. He was a foundry worker, a monument polisher, and a railroad roustabout. But then came 1905. And young Eddie found his great love, the internal combustion engine. Soon, Eddie became a crack mechanic, but this wasn't enough. He wanted to get behind the wheel, and it wasn't long before he achieved this goal. Well, I think my first uh, contact with Ed was at Sioux City, Iowa in 1913. Tommy Milton drove against Eddie many times after that as they pursued their hard and dangerous life across the continent. Uh, some promoters had scraped up a... Uh, prairie and made a track out of it, and Ed was there with what was the predecessor of the Duesenberg car. It was a th three-day meet, uh, but the feature event was, oh, I think 150, maybe 200 miles, which Rick won in a very spectacular drive. I recall a race at uh, Columbus, Ohio, which incidentally I believe was Rick's hometown, uh, and I think Rick was driving one of the Maxwell cars, which had been built by Ray Haroon. And he was leading the race. But the thing got away from him. He went through the outer fence. As I recall, Rick was not at all seriously injured in the mishap, however. Rick was much inclined to go out in front, and as long as his car stayed under him, he stayed out in front. That isn't necessarily the best way to win races. It's a lot of fun, though. Rickenbacker became a headliner, but he never came in better than 10th in the 500-mile race at Indianapolis. But he did set a new world speed record with the Blitz and Benz at Daytona Beach. But war threatened to step into this racing career, and Eddie had an idea. 
He wanted to organize the country's top racing drivers into a special flying unit that would be prepared to go overseas if the United States entered the war then raging in Europe. The government turned down his suggestion, but this didn't stop Eddie. He wanted to fly, and he would make it one way or another. He started from the ground up. Over there! Seven weeks after the U.S. declared war, Eddie was sworn in as a sergeant and went overseas as a driver attached to General Pershing's staff. And later he was assigned to drive Billy Mitchell around France. Eddie pestered the famous airman for a chance to fly, and the badgering finally paid off, even though he had to lie about his age. He was almost 27, two years over the limit for pilot, but he made it. On completion of his flying school... He was transferred to Issoudun Field as engineering officer. We had not been in Issoudun but a few days and under these very bad conditions uh, when we found that uh, everyone in command uh, had a German name. Reed Chambers, another immortal of the 94th Pursuit Squadron, tells what it was like at group headquarters. Uh, Carl Spotts, at that time, he spelled it S-P-A-A-T-Z. Uh, of course, we later found out that he was a Pennsylvania Dutchman. And as you all know, he became one of our great generals in World War II. He was officer in charge of flying. Uh, Herman Spiegel was officer in charge of transportation. Uh, Captain Wiedenbach uh, was adjutant. And Tittle was Sergeant Major. Wiedenbach and Tittle had both uh, served in the German Army, although they were naturalized American citizens, and spoke with a very decided German accent. In view of the fact that we were being treated as enlisted men, uh, and there were no airplanes to fly, no uh, flying fields to fly them off of it, uh, we were, of course, uh, very low in morale. And uh, it wasn't too long until we made up our minds that the officers in charge of Isabdun were a bunch of dirty German saboteurs. Uh, and uh, we uh, found that a guy in charge of engineering was named Rickenbacker. When he arrived, none of the gang would even speak to him. But I went up and uh, said hello, and uh, we uh, immediately uh, started teaming up. With that, uh, my own crowd ostracized me. So that uh, none of the people that I had learned to fly with in the United States would talk to uh, Rickenbacker, and they wouldn't talk to me because I would talk to Rickenbacker. Those were rough days for Reddy. First he was grounded, and then ostracized by his fellow flyers. But the time finally came when he was to take his first patrol over enemy territory with Douglas Campbell, another green airman. About the end of March 1918, when our squadron had just been formed and equipped and was at uh, a place called Villeneuve near Epernay in the Champagne district of France, uh... Major Raoul Luffberry, uh, who had made a great name for himself as an ace in the Lafayette Escadrille and had been uh, and had transferred to the United States Air Service and was uh, one of the flight commanders of our squadron, uh, asked Rick and myself to. Uh, Accompany him on a patrol over the lines near Reims. We were, of course, uh, delighted and excited because it was our first try at it. So we took off in our Newport 28s, and uh, he led us over the lines up and down for uh, perhaps an hour and a half, an hour and three quarters, which was the extent of our fuel supply in those aircraft. Uh, 
But it seemed, uh, most of the time, a little dull. We uh, encountered some anti-aircraft fire uh, shortly after we got near the lines, which was uh, a surprise, uh, but one which we uh, learned to get used to. But aside from that, uh, it was a cold, gray day with a high ceiling, and uh, there didn't seem to be any particular activity going on, uh, either on the ground or in the air. But when we came back uh, and landed at our uh, airdrome, uh, Luftberry asked us to report what we'd seen. So we reported the anti-aircraft bursts that had been near us, and that was all. Lufbury laughed and said, Well, I thought you fellows probably wouldn't see much your first flight over. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, a flight of French spads uh, passed fairly close underneath us. There was another flight of uh, French spads uh, off to the side at one time. And just before we uh, started back to our landing field, there were three or four uh, German albatross and a German observation plane uh, just on the other side of the lines, not very far away from us. But uh, I knew that green pilots uh, don't see much the first time up, so I was reluctant to uh, attack them and get you <coughs> fellas into trouble. <laughs> That's the way it went on that first flight, but it was just a start for Eddie. About a month later, on April 29th, 1918, he shot down his first German plane, an Albatross single-seater. He did this by driving his Newport out of the sun until he was less than 150 yards from his quarry before opening fire. This is the way he fought. But there were other airmen with Eddie, airmen such as Leroy Prinz, now dance director at Metro Golden Mayor who had fun and made merry even while flying. Ty, I had 18 official planes to my credit. Um, all American, of course. In fact, I was probably the only man in the 94th Squadron that went, that had such a credit. And I, my, my title was Crash Ace. Of course, people ask me why, and I always tell them, well, we couldn't all be heroes in the 94th. Rickenbacker was setting such a terrific pace. The Germans had to shoot somebody down, and <clears throat> so I was elected. Unfortunately, being short, I, I, I wasn't too good a pilot. And I got called on the carpet by Rickenbacker, and uh, he said he thought maybe it would be good for me to be assigned to General Mitchell as an aide-de-camp, uh, which later turned out to be decorations officer. And I asked him what would be this particular reason. He said he thought it would be good for two reasons. He thought I'd be a good man the general staff and show him out. And also, then his face got a little red and he blared up. He said he wanted to build up the Air Force a little bit. Seemed like I was taking him down faster than the Germans were. In fact, he said I was the only German ace in the American Air Force. Well, my official job was to get in a truck and come back with a load of nurses. I seemed to be able to manage and round them up all the time and... Uh, and down in this gullies we'd go where a table would be set up and we'd manage to have music and a dance, etc. And, of course, invariably they were broken up because pretty every night we had a visit from the Germans. I you know how tough it was to have the lights go out with nothing but a lot of nurses around. That was murder. With Eddie, it was a serious business. He hunted with coldness and logic. Not a fancy pilot, but a fighter. On the ground, he checked his engine himself, and for fear of jamming his guns in combat, he examined every bullet himself before he loaded his machine gun belt. Colonel Fred Ordway, now of Washington, describes Eddie's approach to his job. Teddy Rickenbacker, as I've always said, was uh, much older and more matured. He was a, um, a disciplinarian, an excellent fighter, very careful and calculating, uh, he did not believe in, in taking unnecessary chances. He uh, was quite the opposite of Frank Luke, 
who uh, would not hesitate to dive into a formation of enemy enemy aircraft when he was outnumbered five or six or seven to one. That didn't worry Frank Luke in the least. Eddie Rickenbacker was uh, much more careful and calculating and uh, didn't believe in, in taking uh, unnecessary risks. He was very strict in regard to uh, the manner in which the pilots conducted themselves and around the airfield and, and, of course, in combat. And he was also very careful in protecting younger pilots on their first trips over the lines. He was um, would be inclined to fly above them, and if they were attacked and in a dangerous position, he would dive in on the enemy aircraft and uh, either shoot it down or, or chase it away. This has been Eddie's way of doing things throughout his life. Rick, of course, is a, is a, is a hard taskmaster because... He doesn't drive anybody, he leads them, but he sets a terrific example. Real leaders are that way. They set the example, and lead the way, and show the way, and you just naturally fall in behind them. And he has no, he has nothing but contempt for anybody who's lazy. Yes, Eddie was a hard taskmaster in those days, but he was no longer ostracized by his fellow pilots who had begun to love him, even though they had described him as a tough hombre. He was now a flamboyant figure in his breeches and fancy non-regulation British boots, probably the shiniest in the American Expeditionary Force. And on September 24th, 1918, he was commissioned a captain and put in command of the squadron. Eddie started out rather dramatically in his new post. Before breakfast on his first day of command, he attacked seven German planes single-handedly and shot down two. This feat later won for him the Congressional Medal of Honor. The 94th Squadron at this time was caught in the final big effort of the war. There were no leads and virtually no rest for the pilots. Reed Chambers, who flew with Eddie throughout this period, knows from first-hand knowledge just how Rickenbacker achieved such success. Rick and I uh, got permission to uh, fly uh, voluntary patrols together. And after our regular formations, uh, we would take off and uh, go uh, out uh, on hunting expeditions. Remember that the planes we're flying then had a top speed, even downhill, of about 130 miles an hour. And he had had lots of racing experience and around 100 miles an hour during hubcap to hubcap. Uh, <clears throat> I could out uh, fly Rick, I'd get on his tail and stay there. I could shoot uh, more holes in a towed target than he could. But uh, when the target started shoot back, shooting back at me, that was a horse of a different color. Uh, Rick, uh, I, w I would start uh, shooting at an enemy plane uh, uh, at, uh, too, uh, too far away and as a result missed many shots. W Rick would withhold his fire until he could practically see the whites of the fellow's eyes and he never missed. Uh, he was a terrific judge of distance. I, he only made one mistake, and one day he did pull up uh, a little too close and uh, clipped a German albatross with his tail skid and pulled the German's wing off. Uh, he uh, got him by actually colliding with him without getting hurt himself. Rick and I, when we were going out alone, would always have a little private briefing and decide where we were going to go hunting and what clouds we were going to look over and under. And uh, we developed a favorite expression, which we used uh, always as we would part to get into our respective airplanes. And that was, well, baby, I'll be slapping you in the face with a spade. And uh, uh, it uh, sort of became funny to us, because sometimes we weren't sure which was going to slap who in the face with a spade. On October 30th, 1918, just before sundown, Eddie landed his plane after shooting down a Fokker and a balloon. Those were his last victories in the war. And when the armistice was signed on November 11th, the score was official. 26 planes shot down in seven months. The end of the war for that colorful figure in his tight breeches, a man who had kept two spad pursuit planes, each bearing the number one in the famed Hat in the Ring insignia, who had landed one, gulped coffee, and took off in another, flying as much as seven hours a day. But the war was over. No longer would Eddie and his fellow pilots make up such squadron ballads as this one. When the final taps had sounded 
and we lay aside life's cares. And we fly our last old spad on heaven's golden stairs. And the angels bid us welcome, and the harps begin to play. Tis then we'll hear St. Peter as he greets us with a yell. Front seats for you of 94, for you've done your hitch in hell. Eddie and his friends were a rough, tough, rollicking bunch of flyers, but real pioneers in the air. They lived hard and furious, but Reed Chambers knew another side of Eddie. Rick was always religious. He and I uh, uh, lived together uh, practically all the time we were on the front. And every night, Rick would kneel by the side of his bed and uh, put his head in his arms. And uh, while he uh, made no sound, I uh, still am convinced that he was praying. Uh, in fact, uh, his religion, uh, for my money, is far better than uh, that of uh, most of the creeds that I know of. If everybody lived like Rick does, it would be a far better world. Captain Eddie came home to a hero's welcome, big reception, endless speeches. But when these had ended, Eddie embarked on the first phase of his business career. Maybe folks would argue with me about this, but I think the greatest single contribution he has made to America is the example that he sets. Even today, uh, as a businessman... As a rugged individualist, as a man who who uh, who likes to try to make things stand on their own feet and pay their own way, and and uh, a man who stands for less and less government interference in the in private industry, uh, as a champion of real economics in industry, that's that's the kind of a thing he's doing. But Eddie's first really big business venture was not going to be a success. He wanted to build the great American car. And he and three Detroit automobile men formed the Rickenbacker Motor Company. It was organized in 1922 with $5 million capital. This dream child was unveiled in New York and at first was a big success. The Rickenbacker looked like a sure winner. And it was difficult to keep up with the demand for the car. It had many engineering firsts, including four-wheel brakes. But this innovation proved to be a detriment, at least at that time. The car was criticized, and the brakes were described as dangerous because they brought the car to a stop too suddenly. Finally, this criticism, coupled with the 1925 slump, brought to a close Eddie's dream of a great American car, and it left him with a quarter of a million dollar debt, which he swore he'd pay off, and he did, later. More and more he turned to the aircraft industry, and while working for General Motors was connected with the Fokker Aircraft Corporation and Eastern Airlines, then owned by the big corporation. Another company owned by General Motors at that time was Eastern Airlines. Alfred P. Sloan, former president of General Motors and later chairman of the board. At that time, in 1934, Eddie had charge of what was then the General Motors Eastern Airlines Division. Finally, the time was reached when the corporation decided to remain in manufacturing and dispose of its interest in aeroplane operation. This necessitated the sale of our Eastern Airlines division. Eddie was much interested and extremely anxious to work out something whereby he could take over our interest in aeroplane operation. I am reminded of how he telephoned me shortly before Christmas in 1938. It so happened that his opportunity to purchase the property expired the next day. While he had promises of financial support, he had nothing tangible to offer. He was, of course, worried and upset, as he naturally would be. He decided to call me at 11 o'clock on a Saturday night, and asked if he could come in for a few minutes. Of course, I told him he certainly could. 
He comments on the fact that on his arrival, he found me in pajamas, a robe, and slippers. He never was able to quite figure out whether he had wakened me, got me out of bed, or how it happened. Anyhow, eh, we had a discussion on the subject. I told him further. I did not know just what the status was, as it was being handled by the financial people in General Motors. But I promised him I would look into the matter immediately, and if a commitment had not been made, I would assure him a real opportunity to see what he might do. And further, not to worry about it. Eddie rounded up three and a half million dollars in 30 hectic days. I can't talk from the standpoint of his colorful exploits as an automobile racer or a fire in World War I uh, because I didn't know him at that time. But I can speak uh, from very definite knowledge of that phase of his life with which I've had the closest contact namely his business career. Hugh Nelton of the investment firm of Kuhn Loeb tells why the financial world had confidence in Eddie, even though his Rickenbacker car of the 20s had been a failure. Twenty years ago, in the spring of 1938, my firm had an important part in the purchase of Eastern Airlines from General Motors. At that time, this airline was a mere fledgling. It was doing a business the total business at a rate under five million dollars a year. Eddie Rickenbacker's confidence in the future of this enterprise was terrific. It was unflagging and it was contagious. But even so, it required a real element of faith because no one had yet demonstrated the ability to make an airline profitable. The that that Eddie Rickenbacker's talents were equal to this challenge is certainly most dramatically shown by this fact. Eastern Airlines has operated profitably every year since that time. This is an outstanding record in the industry, and today this little acorn, which, uh, 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 this little acorn of 1938 has grown into a tremendous oak now operating at an annual rate not of five million dollars as in 1937 but 265 million dollars a growth of 5200 percent all under the leadership of eddie rickenbacker this time there was no doubt eddie had become a successful businessman a captain of industry along the way he had bought the indianapolis speedway at a cost of seven hundred thousand dollars But now, once again, his great love was the airplane and air transportation. Alfred P. Sloan again had a conversation with Eddie, and again Captain Eddie suggested something based on what he had seen in Europe. He had been in England, through the Middle East and Russia, on confidential missions for the government. On his return, he came in to see me, and we had lunch together and discussed aviation technique from its various angles. At that time, he was enthusiastic about the potentiality of jet turbine power for airplanes, as was being developed in England, Russia, and Germany. He felt that a great corporation like General Motors should be involved in this development, both for the sake of our national security and our general economy looking to the future. He also urged upon me the fact that our government and our military services were far behind the English, Germans, and the Russians in the development of this type of power. How fully subsequent events have proved Eddie's keen foresight. But Eddie's contribution to the advancement of our society has been far broader than his initial interest in the automobile industry and later service as an airplane executive. He has distinguished himself as an American at the highest level of patriotism and service to the welfare of his country, both in war and in peace. We will return to Biography and Sound, Captain Eddie the Iron Eagle, after a pause for station identification. Captain Eddie was continually on the watch for new developments in the aircraft industry. From my point of view, he could properly be considered the dean of the air transport industry. Lawrence Rockefeller, 
a director of Eastern Airlines and a friend of Eddie's, sums it up this way. Someone who brought uh, the discipline of business method and accounting, of economy, and far-sighted planning into the industry. He uh, expects to get uh, the cooperation and backing of his associates, and he takes a good deal of convincing to convince him that maybe he is wrong. If he is, naturally he recognizes it, but just vacillating opinions or casual guesses uh, don't make much impression on him. You have to be factual, and you have to have a good deal of steam behind your facts if you're going to change his point of view. He is amazing, though, because he is such a great leader, and yet he does have, it's kind of, it's, you know, mm -hmm. this ability to go down into the organization and listen and get facts, but still, as leader, he makes the decisions. Yes, Eddie Rickenbacker was now firmly established as the well-publicized president of Eastern Airlines and was in the news again and again. One veteran newspaper man who got to know him well was Jim Kilgallen of International News Service. My association with him has gone back 35 or 40 years. Let's see. Yeah. I had known him back since the days when he was fooling with cars and was going to be a race driver back there in Indianapolis where the famous Speedway is. He was always a, a straight, honest-to-gosh sort of a fellow, down to earth, feet on the ground, not a bit of pretense about him. Uh, he's one of these men who uh, makes a million friends but doesn't hesitate to make an enemy. Uh, Rickenbacker is in the past often taken a stand on something which was unpopular and he would draw criticism but he's the type that uh, uh, never backed up I don't know whether it's any good to break it up now but uh, he didn't believe certain things and said so in speeches and he would get uh subjected to a lot of criticism, but he didn't seem to mind it. Eddie capitalized on his own popularity, making friends for Eastern. He also collected an assortment of enemies. Organized labor was openly against him for his wartime criticism. And labor didn't react in too friendly a fashion when Eddie reminded them that he had been a working stiff too and had been glad to get a dollar a day. He put this criticism behind him and continued to fly Eastern's routes minutely examining every phase of the operation. On one of these trips, he wound up in South America with Arthur Godfrey. I think the most amusing incident we had was in Santiago in Chile. We uh, were there just in time to witness a minor revolution. And they brought out the Carabinieri, I think they call it. Carabinieri, the, the uh, police, who have little short... Tommy guns. And by George, they they put on a shooting match right there in the city square, right in front of the hotel where we were. And then it died down, and we thought it was over, and we had a dinner date, a high-level dinner we were supposed to go to, right down one of the streets off the square. And we started down that street, Rick and I, and some of the other uh, people who were on the trip with us, and... Uh, as we walked down this street, a very narrow street with high stone walls on each side, uh, a fusillade of bullets, a hail of them came down that street. And they were going ping, 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 and banging off the walls on either side of us. We turned around and started running. And I thought I was going fast, but here come Rick past me saying, what's holding you up, boy? <laughs> And we, as he said, we went back to our hotel to previously prepared positions at the bar and thought it over. That trip was exciting but fun. Another trip ended in tragedy. On the afternoon of February 26, 1941, Eddie boarded a plane in New York, bound for Mexico City with stops in Washington and Atlanta. The time came when the plane should have been over Atlanta Airport, ready to start an instrument landing in the fog. The pilots started to set the plane down. A split second later, a wing hit the treetops. The plane hit the ground ten miles outside the city. Ralph McGill, 
editor of the Atlanta Constitution, was in the rescue party when it reached the scene of the crash. As dawn broke, uh, we found ourselves really almost on the wreck. And, of course, seen literally through a, a drifting curtain of fog, it was an, an awful sight, as those things always are. So there they lay the DC-3, uh, one of the most completely wrecked aircraft I've ever seen. The front of the airplane was almost mangled, as if it had been run through some great set of teeth, well past the cockpit and into the first row or two of seats. At any rate, we, we began to lift up these tangled and broken pieces of wreckage. And up near the front, I would say about a third of the way back in the cabin, or where the cabin normally would be, we found Captain Rickenbacker. We first thought we had found his body. Someone said, leaning down and feeling his pulse, uh, he's dead. What we didn't know at the time was that one of the news agency men set out then because Captain Rickenbacker was the most notable passenger aboard the plane. He set out and, and ran through the mud and the thickets uh, uh, about a mile or a little more to a telephone and flashed in the word that Captain Rickenbacker was dead. We were holding the presses in Atlanta and... Uh, we started out with an extra of this. Fortunately, uh, the later word got in, and none of the papers uh, got on the street. But uh, the headline did say Rickenbacker dead. At any rate, to go back to the wreck, we finally got him moved out. And then, uh, by putting a hand up under his shirt, one could feel a very faint heartbeat. We didn't quite believe it at first. It was a night of trial for Eddie. His skull was crushed, his left arm broken, his left eye was bloodied, both legs were broken, and his lungs were cut by jagged stubs of ribs. But through it all, Eddie managed to keep the other survivors from destroying themselves. You could hear some groans, you could hear somebody calling for help every now and then, and people talking, praying, and that sort of thing. And, uh, he kept calling to them, don't light a match. Don't light a match. Uh, uh, don't uh, use a lighter, a cigarette lighter. Because he knew if any flame should have come, the whole thing would have gone up and, and everyone would have been burned to death. Eddie was taken to Piedmont Hospital in Atlanta, where he lay in a coma for many days. I was there the day that he became conscious for the first time. He had, of course, been under an oxygen tent. And uh, he began to stir around. The nurse notified the doctors. And uh, they came in. And uh, he <clears throat> opened up at one eye and looked around. Spoke to people. And he said, I'm hungry. Well, of course, that delighted everyone. They'd been hoping for that because the only thing he'd had in the way of food was some intravenous feeding. And uh, so Dr. McRae said, well, that's wonderful, Eddie. What would you like? Captain Rickenbacker reflected and he said, well, I'll tell you, doctor, I have an appetite right now for a ham sandwich and maybe a bottle of beer. It was almost four months before Eddie got out of the hospital. Then, war again. December 7th, and the attack on Pearl Harbor. One day, General Hap Arnold, commander of the Army Air Forces, called Eddie and proposed a job. That is, if he felt well enough to do it. Eddie did. He was to make a flying tour to every Air Force combat unit and instill in the men the sense of conquest that is the core of combat psychology. Said General Arnold, Tell Rick... I want them to put turpentine under their tails. I want to get those youngsters fighting mad. Eddie did just that. Then there was a trip to Russia, and a story told by Eddie 
to actor Adolf Manjou. They just got back from Moscow, and he gave me a, a Russian bill, autographed it as a souvenir, which I added to my short snorter, which everybody had at that time. And he told me a very interesting uh, thing that had happened. The uh, Russians, as, as is their uh, custom, decided to try to get him drunk. And uh, they were drinking vodka out of uh, water glasses, like water. And uh, Rickenbacker, not to show the white feather, he, said, he turned to his aide and said, you stand behind me and hold me up, because I'm going to drink glass for glass for these fellas. And when it was over, he said, they were on the floor, not me. He was being propped. A tough man, Eddie. Finally, he was asked to make a tour of our Pacific bases. Eddie and Colonel Hans C. Adamson left for Honolulu with a stopover in Los Angeles so that he could see his mother and brother Dewey. It was October 1942. Eddie was to leave Hickam Field in a flying fortress bound for Australia with a stop at Canton Island, just a speck in the Pacific. That plane never made Canton Island. And with that, started a long ordeal for Captain Eddie. James Reynolds, who now lives in Oakland, California, was the radio operator on that ill-fated flying fortress. As near as I remember, is around 4 o'clock in the afternoon. We knew that we were going to have to find land fairly soon, or we're going to have to set it down in the water. Well, you have roughly 25 ton of airplane. We had Bombay tanks that were empty. The wing tanks were nearly empty. And Bill Cherry made one of the finest landings I've ever seen or heard of since. He brought it in tail low, hit the crest of one wave, went into the air again, and then skidded it around to set the body of the plane, the fuselage of the plane, into the trough. When we crashed, uh, after taking to the rafts, we counted up what food we had. We had four very anemic Southern California oranges and a package of fish line and hooks that come in a jungle kit on the back of a parachute. We split those oranges up and made them last as long as we could, more for the fluid than anything else. The rest of the time, we lived on fish. We managed to catch two with the line that had been taken by one of the members. Two jumped into the raft, being chased by larger fish, and we caught one shark. But they were so strong and rancid, we couldn't get anywhere near it, even after drying it out. And we managed to catch a few fish that would hide underneath the raft. From the larger fish, they were small, inch, two inches long. And all of us, Rick included, ate them tail, feathers and all. Back here in the United States, Eddie's friends just couldn't believe he had died. Their reaction was much the same as this, expressed by Arthur Godfrey. Oh, no, no, not Eddie. He'll be back. Yes, we, we knew he was all right somewhere because... Uh, you know, this survival business is uh, lots of luck, yes, but there's also a great deal in the preparation a man makes. The man was... Uh, Rick was, was mentally prepared, if you know what I mean. And, of course, Eddie wasn't dead. Far from it. During those long hours on the cramp raft, Eddie was unyielding in his firm discipline and, as a result, kept a firm hand on the actions of the others. Well, he's a shrewd person, very shrewd. He must have been to get where he is today. Uh, I don't believe the man is ruthless or would hurt anyone intentionally. But my best description of the man, if you hated him, hated these guts, you'd have to admire him for them. Rickenbacker didn't wander off uh, as much on a tangent as the most of us did in our minds. His mind stayed, I would say... As clear, if not clearer, than the rest of us. One uh, night, Colonel Adamson went over the side to try to end it all. Uh, he was the only one hurt in the actual crash, but uh, Rick and myself and one of the others pulled him back in, and I've heard a man get a tongue lashing, and being an old friend of Rick's, Adamson took it. But I'd hate to get one like it myself. Eddie's discipline throughout those long days and nights of desperation was probably resented by some of the other occupants of the rafts, but he continued to harass them. I don't believe the man knows the word of fear. 
He might, uh, he might internally, but Rickenbacker never displayed, uh, displayed a element of fear whatsoever. There's only one incident that I remember where he was really, Rick was really pushed out of shape was when he caught one of them drinking more water than he should have at the time because we were on rations, very strict rations. We had no water at all for the first eight days and for the remainder of the time, the most we had any one day was a jigger of water, about an ounce of water a day. He told him that the rest of our lives depended on uh, that water. Uh, Our water came from catching rainwater in our underclothes, our socks, our pants, our shirts, and wringing them out into a bucket and then taking them into our mouth and mouthing them inside of, through the tubes inside of a Mae West life jacket. So we had very little water the whole period of time out there. And uh, he really laid the law down to him that uh, you ever catch him him doing it again, why it might lead to uh, severe punishment if we were ever picked up. I think all of us were sore at him at one time or another. Uh, uh, Rick was a, a man that kept at you to keep you going, if nothing else. And uh, Lieutenant Whitaker, the co-pilot, said he was going to live just to spite him. Finally, after 24 days of torture, 24 days of sun, of hunger and of thirst, came an answer to the long hours of prayer. Planes came out of the sky, passed over, then returned, passed over again and left. But they did return, landed, and thus achieved one of the most famous rescues of all time. It was the end of an ordeal. Captain Eddie Rickenbacker tells of the effects of those 24 long days on a raft. I've often been asked, particularly in recent years, what effect that experience has had, if any, what it left. Frankly, physically, it has never left anything detrimental or mentally detrimental. Spiritually, it has left a wonderful feeling of the unbelievable almost. Because when I got back, I found that the world at large seemed interested. That may sound egotistical, but the... Newspapers showed that there was tremendous interest in the fact that we'd been picked up and rescued, particularly me. And I analy- as I analyzed it, it brought to mind the fact that I was merely a symbol in the minds of millions of mothers and fathers, sweethearts and wives, who felt and got the satisfaction out of the fact that I was picked up, that their beloved ones also had a chance to be rescued and would come back. Unfortunately, all of them didn't, but it was a great feeling of hope. Back to the living came Captain Eddie Rickenbacker, Colonel Adamson, Pilot William Cherry, Co-Pilot James Whitaker, Lieutenant John DeAngelis, the navigator, Private John Bartek, and radio operator James Reynolds. Staff Sergeant Alex Kosmachik would never return. In the years since that ordeal, Eddie may have become a quieter man, but he still has all of his cocky assurance, big grin, and unshakable faith in the future of the air transport industry in these fledgling years of the jet age. As a flyer, of course, Rick doesn't fly anymore at the controls. He hasn't for some time. But uh, he, those controls, those throttles are still in his hand when he sits in one of those airplanes because he's watching his pilots and and almost gloating sometimes. It's almost gloating in the progress that, that pilots have made, that airlines have made, in the safety, for instance, and in the economy and the, the uh, convenience of airline flight. Yes. Captain Eddie is still going strong, and he still flies endless miles along his system, still with the feel of the wild blue sky in his blood. He's a great, throbbing example of the absolute idiocy of retiring a man just because he's 65 arbitrarily. Great heavenly days, this man will be, his Rickenbacker will go on until one day that brave old pump just quits. 
Captain Eddie Rickenbacker. The Iron Eagle. A man still looking to the future as he answers this question put to him by movie star and fellow airman, James Stewart. Captain Eddie... I'm going to ask you a question. We're sort of making this the anniversary question, and we'd appreciate your comments on it. And here's the question. Against the background of Air Force history, what stands out most vividly in your mind, and what do you see as the greatest problem ahead? Jimmy, it's very simple to me. Number one, the accomplishment of the men and women of America in achieving the greatest air force power or air power that the world has ever known in the short span of 50 years, an accomplishment worthy of every man, woman, and child who has played a part in that development. Secondly, the problem of the future is for those of us of the living to impress on those who are to come and to leave behind a heritage and a tradition for them to follow so that they in turn may profit by the mistakes that we have made by the penalties that we have paid and the generations of the future may live in peace and happiness. Captain Eddie, the Iron Eagle. Another in the NBC series, Biographies and Sound. Your guide was Walter O'Keefe. This program was written and produced by Don Cameron, supervised by James L. Holton for NBC News. This is Dick Sinclair. Nowadays, you can hardly pick up a newspaper without reading something about the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, better known as NATO. But did you ever stop to think why NATO is so important, especially to the United States? Sure, we're a powerful nation, but we still depend on the free countries of Western Europe for a great deal. When it comes to exporting trade, for instance, Western Europe is our best customer. And that's where a lot of our vital raw materials come from, too. As far as the world's total manufacturing production is concerned, America accounts for 40% of it. But combined with Western Europe's 30%, the free world controls 70%. And that isn't all. With Western Europe as a partner, we can share mutual advancements in science and invention and our seaports and air bases. Now, those are just a few reasons why NATO is so important to the United States. And most important of all, NATO is guarding your freedom. Biographies and Sound has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.